One, two, three, four, let's go. It's hardly. It's a fabulous show. Alaska. I heart beat Alaska. It's hardly. <laughs> Alaska. Pull up a chair and enjoy the show. You hear it from Sitka to Barrow. Gather around for Genie's show. It's the alley. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Harpy Alaska Native News and Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green with the only program in America that takes you every week to remote villages across the state of Alaska. This week, we visit my people, the Inupiat people of the Arctic Slope. It's a great show. Don't go away. I'll see you in a minute. Harpy Alaska is brought to you by the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation and ASRC Energy Services a subsidiary of Arctic Slope Regional Corporation. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. Heartbeat Alaska is made possible by Kupik Carlisle Transportation, your full-service transportation and logistics company. Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Flying in Alaska? Fly Frontier, the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier is expanding again. They've added new routes to Nome, Kotzebue, and the surrounding villages. As you can see, Frontier is now really covering Alaska. So the next time you fly, try Frontier. Frontier offers quick, convenient check-in, low fares, and service direct to many of the villages. Frontier Flying Service, the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Make it your official airline, too. It's the Elliot, the Indian and the Eskimo. It's the Elliot, the Indian and the Eskimo. Welcome one, welcome all. I have a personal special soft spot in my heart for the Inupiat people of the north because they're my people. My grandfather Tony Jewell was born in Point Hope. He was a whaling captain amongst many other things but he was a whaling captain. He was the last whaling captain in Point Lay to get whales many many years ago and speaking of years ago we're taking you all the way back the history of the Inupiat before contact with Western civilization all the way up to today. The history of the Inupiaq people of the North Slope is brought to you by the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation. For thousands of years, the Inupiaq have existed on the North Slope of Alaska. Archaeological evidence gathered at Point Hope and Barrow confirmed this. In 1826, English explorer Captain Frederick William Beachy set out to plot Alaska's North Slope. Along the way, he and others gave various North Slope villages English names after their crew members. Each village had an Inupiaq name, but the pronouncing of the names were difficult for Captain Beachy and his crew. For example, Point Hope was named after Sir William Johnstone Hope, the map maker for the expedition. The Inupiaq name for Point Hope is Tikirak. Translated into English, it means point of land. 
During the commercial whaling era, Jabbertown, a whaling camp, was established near Tikera. Once there was almost 5,000 people living in Tikera, but warring and disease like the German measles and influenza wiped out most of the population. Point Hope is the second largest village on the North Slope and has been the most continuously occupied village for over 2,500 years. According to the 2000 census, Point Hope's population is over 750. Traditional subsistence activity, supplemented with a moderate cash economy, makes up the lifestyle of this Inupiaq community. Northeast of Point Hope, lies the village of Point Lay. Point Lay is the last remaining village of the Kukbaruk people. Point Lay was named after George Tradescant Lay, a lieutenant on Captain Beachy's crew. The Inupiaq name for Point Lay is Kali. Around 250 people reside at Point Lay. The beach formation near the village restricts the ability to hunt bowhead whales. Icy Cape, some 40 miles north of Point Lay, is better suited for hunting bowhead whales. The last bowhead whale caught by the village was in 1940. Mainly, beluga whales are harvested at nearby Kasigelik Lagoon. Further north along Alaska's western north slope coastline is the village of Wainwright. Captain Beachy named the village after Lieutenant John Wainwright. The Inupiaq name for Wainwright is Ulronek, meaning fallen slope. Wainwright is the third largest village on the North Slope with nearly 550 people. The ancestors of Wainwright include the Utukkarmiu and Kugmiu people. Whaling, hunting, and gathering of plants roots and berries provide the essentials for these Inupiat. Today, perhaps the most recognized of all North Slope villages is Barrow, which was named after Sir John Barrow, another map maker who was a friend of Captain Beachy. Inupiaq name is Ukbiarvik, which means place to hunt snowy owls. Home to over 4,500 people, Barrow is the hub of the North Slope and the business center of the region. In 1946, the United States Navy came to Barrow and began exploration on what was then called the Naval Petroleum Reserve No. 4. The Naval Arctic Research Laboratory, or NARL, was initially established to conduct seismological oil and gas work in the reserve. The lab also studied the animal and plant life of the region. Located in the Colville River Delta is Nuixit. Nuixit is surrounded by the Alpine oil field to the north, the Kukparuk oil field to the east, and the National Petroleum Reserve, Alaska, to the west. This region provides an abundance of subsistence resources to the Kukbigmute of Nuixit. Fish from the Colville River and caribou from the land are main staples of the Kukbigmute. And in the fall, crews from the village take part in the bowhead whale hunt. Today, Nuixit is home to nearly 450 people and has become a hub of recent activity since the Alpine oil field began production in late 2000. Kaktovik means place for seining. It is located 90 miles west of the Canadian border on the northern edge of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. One account as to how Kaktovik got its name talks about how a couple's only son was killed there. His parents found the body by seining. Another variant discusses how a man by the name of Pifsuk drowned in the lagoon east of Barter Island. The people of Kaktorvik recovered his body with a seining net. Kaktorvik was a trading place for whalers and the Inupiat 
during the commercial whaling era and became known as Barter Island. Today, this subsistence-based community of around 300 people continues the tradition of whaling and hunting. The debate on whether to open the Anwar coastal plain to exploration and development has brought national attention to this small Inupiaq community that prides itself in living along and within the national refuge. Lieutenant Patrick Henry Ray, who was on an expedition to conduct weather and magnetic observations along with nine other men, arrived in Barrow in 1881. Early in the spring of 1882, he traveled with two Inupiaq families to obtain fresh meat and crossed what he named the Mead River after Major General George G. Meade of the U.S. Army. In the 1950s and early 60s, coal was a source of heating and was hauled to Barrow by cat train. Along the Meade River sits the Inupiaq village of Atkasuk. With a population of around 230, Atkasuk has the biggest town site on the north slope with over 27,000 acres. Atkasuk is also known for its fruitful salmon berries that grow on their land and for the many fish that are caught from nearby rivers and creeks. 250 miles northwest of Fairbanks and about the same distance southeast of Barrow sits the village of Anakduvak Pass. This village of around 290 people is within the gates of the Arctic National Park and Preserve. Anakduvak Pass is a historic caribou migration route. However, in the early 1900s, the original Nunamiu left the area due to a collapse in the caribou numbers. Many returned in the 1940s to reestablish the present-day village of Anakduvak Pass. Sitting in the Brooks Range Mountains, Anakduvak Pass is a beautiful illustration of the true majesty of Arctic Slope lands. Whaling is a valued tradition among the North Slope Inupiat. It provides not only meat and muktuk for residents, but also provides opportunities to gather and celebrate a way of life that remains as strong today as it did centuries ago. Today's program is almost like going to school, isn't it? Such an education. Don't go away, there's more. I can make a difference. I am a commercial fisherman. I am a tribal leader. I know how to work together and bring people together. I'm running because I've been down to Juneau several times in the past few years, and I think we need a change of leadership down there. I have the experience of uh, economic development in rural Alaska and providing health care in rural Alaska, and we need to make sure these rural areas continue to exist. I'm Robert Moose Henrich, and I approve this ad. I can make a difference. Did you know that my Eskimo name was Apiak or Apayak, depending on what dialect you speak. More information coming up. Whaling, fishing, hunting seals, walrus, caribou and birds, and gathering the food for survival is at the base of the Inupiaq culture. The Inupiaq are highly skilled in making tools with stone, ivory, bone, wood, sinew, and metal, tools that are often used in the pursuit of game for subsistence. Here, you see an Inupiaq using a bow drill, which was used to make tools. 
These artifacts were found in Barrow in the early 1980s. The purse is made from caribou skin sewn together with sinew. The button is made from ivory, which came from the tusks of the walrus. The snow goggles are made from driftwood and served as modern-day sunglasses. Bola stones tied together with sinew were used as duck slings. The cup is made of thin wood and is stitched with baleen. There are different types of fishing hooks. One is made of wood with an ivory hook and the other is made of ivory with a metal hook. The hair comb is also made of ivory. The Inupiat make their clothing from animal skins. Caribou, wolverine, wolf, polar bear and seal skins are made into clothing designed to protect them from the extremely frigid climate. For hunting and traveling, Inupiaq people might wear pants made from polar bear, caribou, or seal skin. Here, the woman on the left is wearing a caribou parka with a fur turned inside and waterproof mukluks made from seal skin. The woman on the right is wearing a caribou parka with a fur turned outside. The man on the far left is wearing a caribou parka with a white snow shirt. On his feet are mukluks with sealskin soles that are worn with caribou skin liners and grass insoles. The woman next to him is wearing a caribou skin parka with a walrus tusk design and a wolverine fur ruff that serves as protection from the elements for the face. The man next to them is wearing an everyday snow shirt and a caribou parka with the fur inside. It is common for an Inupiaq woman to carry an infant on her back in a parka designed to accommodate the baby. The homes of the Inupiaq were as creatively made as their clothing. Made from the earth, their sod homes usually had whalebone and driftwood frames and a low tunnel entry for heat efficiency. Driftwood also served another purpose. Dog teams were in use as early as 1600 AD. The sleds were typically made from driftwood with whalebone runners. During the winter, dog sleds served as the main means of travel. During the summer, dogs were used to pack supplies. The umiak has been used by Inupiaq whalers for centuries with very little change to their design. Made with wood frames, the umiak is covered with bearded seal skins that have been sewn together. Inupiaq women have perfected the technique of waterproof skin sewing. The skins are stretched over the frame of the umiak and lashed on using rope. Most of the seal skin boats were rigged with sails to assist in towing a landed whale to shore. It is through the passing down of traditions from one generation to the next that keeps the Inupiaq culture alive. The sharing of traditions often took place in community houses where stories were told. These stories often included knowledge of surroundings in addition to the skills of survival that are key to living in the extreme conditions of Alaska's North Slope. They were lessons learned by watching, listening, and performing. There were no blueprints or written directions because there was no written language. Before then, stories and legends were told by word of mouth. In 1946, Reverend Roy Amawak and Donald Webster began translating the New Testament from English into the Inupiaq language and so created the Inupiaq orthography. In 1968, Reverend Amawak received an honorary doctorate of divinity from Whitworth College for his work in translating the New Testament. Corrections to accommodate a change in the orthography, an addition of chapter outlines took place in the 1990s with the help of Barrow Elder Martha Aiken. Today, Various aspects of the Inupiaq culture and language have been documented and published in many books. These books are used in schools today. For centuries, the common belief was that the well-being of the Inupiaq rested upon the spirits and the one person who could communicate with them, the shaman.
traditional religious practices, including shamanism, were frowned upon by missionaries when they arrived. Today, Christianity is the dominant religion of the Inupiat. In the 1880s, a meeting took place between the Presbyterians, Baptists, Episcopalians, Methodists, Moravians, and the Congregationalists to decide which denomination would cover which area of Alaska. An agreement was reached through the efforts of Sheldon Jackson so that there would not be any competition among the denominations. The Russian Orthodox religion had already been established in parts of southwest and south central Alaska. Today, there are many different denominations across the state with often more than one in each village. The first Presbyterian missionary to arrive in Barrow was Leander M. Stevenson in 1890. The seasonal transporting of supplies to Barrow via ship delayed the building of the mission church until later. Stevenson was a teacher as well as keeper of the refuge station for shipwrecked whalers. At that same time, John B. Driggs had gone to Point Hope serving as an Episcopal missionary, doctor, and teacher to the Inupiaq people. Both missionaries were not particularly successful obtaining conversion, but did perform some heroic medical practices while in Barrow and Point Hope. Driggs left Alaska but returned and lived out the rest of his life in Cape Lisburn, a small village northwest of Point Hope where he is buried. The fourth missionary to arrive in Barrow was Dr. Henry W. Grice during the 1920s and is credited with saving many lives. Grice captured many photos of Barrow in the 20s, leaving us with images of a time gone by. There would be many more missionaries making their way north to convert the Inupiat to a different religion. The main means of traveling north was via passenger ships and freighters like this one. This particular freighter made an annual trip along the Alaska North Slope coast to Barrow, hauling supplies that were used in schools, hospitals, and stores. Steamships replaced sail-powered whaling vessels in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Soon thereafter, gas-powered vessels replaced steamships. When these ships arrived in port, it was one time that locals had a chance to earn a little money unloading these ships. In the late 1920s and 30s, Arctic expeditions were becoming common. Explorers wanted to learn more about the North and the people who called it home. In 1930, this Russian search and rescue plane spent two weeks looking for another Russian plane that was lost in the area they would never find the plane. Ben Eilson piloted the first airplane to land in Barrow in 1926. In 1933, Charles Lindbergh and his wife made a stop at Barrow during his northern route on an expedition to Europe. The whole village was there to greet the pilot and his wife. In 1935, Cherokee Indian humorist Will Rogers and famous test pilot Wiley Post were exploring the northern reaches of America when they crashed at Olakpa, 12 miles southwest of Barrow. Claire Ukbeha and his family, who were camping at the time, witnessed the tragic accident. It is remembered that Claire ran 12 miles to town to deliver the bad news. Today, a monument stands at the crash site and in front of the Barrow Airport, which is named after them. In the 1940s, Wien Airlines started making weekly trips to Barrow. Sig and Noel Wien would alternate trips each week. This was the beginning of a new dependence on air travel for the transporting of goods the Inupiat had become dependent on for their livelihood. During World War II, the Inupiat were involved in defending our nation. Many of them enlisted in the Alaska Territorial Guard. The late Andrew Urina of Barrow recalled Alaska Territorial Governor Ernest Greening's visit to Barrow with Army Major 
Marvin Maktak Marston. Greening was remembered for his limited Inupiaq language skills. That was when we were first signing up for the Alaska Territorial Guard at the church, and he would say in our native tongue, Kuyanak, after we signed up. He would not say anything else. There was widespread church support for the Alaska Territorial Guard. Reverend Fred Claire Cooper of the Barrow Presbyterian Church recalled, We were a strange-looking outfit at first. Tall men, short men, snow shirts of all colors and descriptions, the only distinguishing mark was the cobalt blue and gold stars insignia patch of the Alaska Territorial Guard, worn on the left shoulder. We were proud of those patches. But looks were not the whole story. There were not 110 men anywhere I would rather have anywhere in this area. This was home country to them, and rifles and knives were their stock in trade. On the target range, they were better than recruits anywhere. Eddie Hobson of Barrow, a whaling captain and the former president of the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation, had been a squad leader during the war with the Army's 208th Infantry. He and Bill Egan, who later became Alaska governor, had seen mop-up duty in the Aleutians. Eddie Hobson was picked to be one of 10 non-commissioned officers assigned to train Alaska Territorial Guard units. The late 1950s would be the beginning of a series of changes for the Inupiat. In 1959, Alaska gained statehood. For the indigenous people of Alaska, it became a time to fight for their lands, the same lands that were being granted to the new state of Alaska. The history of the Inupiaq people of the North Slope is brought to you by the Arctic Slope Regional Corporation. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you from Jeannie Green Productions, located in Anchorage, Alaska. If you'd like us to visit your village, call 907-563-7440. And we'll do our best to get there. God bless every single one of you. We'll see you again next week.